my cell phone. We are crossing a threshold here in time. It'll last maybe 50 minutes or an hour of worship of God. <clears throat> my personal request, while we're worshiping God, if we could not have whispered conversations, because when anybody whispers, you get my attention. Whispering is a scream to me. My grandfather was that way. Whenever the, my aunts would whisper, he heard every word they said. <laughs> so when you whisper to each other, it is a distraction. We are going to worship the one and only God now. Let's all stand and sing. These are wonderful. This is our favorite hymn of everybody. God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his The people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vine. Defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. taught us great things he has done and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when Jesus we see everyone praise the Lord praise the Lord let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Please be seated. Good morning, church family, and welcome to Sunnyside. Come all the way in and sit all the way down. That is one of my favorite phrases to really describe being present, being fully committed to this moment. One of the things, I have a couple projects for you right now. Because part of being committed to that moment, this moment is like Gary said, please silence your cell phones. Mine rang during Sabbath school. I am very aware of silencing my <laughs> cell phone. And even besides silencing it, put it down on your seat, behind or beside you, with the face down. So it's not a distraction for you today. Come all the way in and sit all the way down. I'd like you to take your bulletin right now and... Um, I want you to take the first page, okay, the front page, and I want you to turn it back, okay? And we're not doing origami here, but, um, and then I want you to close this part, okay? 
this gives you a rundown of what's happening in our program today on this side. And then in here is crucial information that you need to read later, OK? In, I'm going to give you a couple highlights just so you know what you need to read about. As you can see, we're starting VBS this next week. And you can find all of the information. If you have a child between four years of age and sixth grade that wants to attend, please get them registered. There's a little paperwork to do. You can make donations. If you don't have a child and you want to make donations, you're wel welcome to do that. All of the information, the times, and all of that is available right here. Next, Shaver Lake. Shaver Lake will be back again. We're going to be worshiping in Shaver Lake. There will not be worship service here on August 20. We will be meeting at the little church in Shaver Lake. There is all kinds of fabulously prepared information from our coordinator, Carlin Murdoch, who gives you all the facts that you need to know about when, where, timing, price, etc. There is a little fee for your car to go to the picnic area, etc. All of that information is listed right here, okay? So don't read it now, read it later, but keep this bulletin. And then there's also a little um, thing on the next page about a little announcement about a luncheon that is being planned for Angela for her appreciation of her 21 years of service. She has moved to another organization where she's providing amazing service for them. And but we are going to miss her, and we would just want to show our appreciation for all of her years of service and ministry in our church. The offering today is for church budget, so whether you have marked or unmarked offering, that's what it will go to to help support some of these ministries that are going on. And now I would like for you to come all the way in and sit all the way down, and let's worship together. We're going to start with a responsive reading. I'm going to read first, and then Ken will lead the congregation in um, reading the bold print. Let's worship together. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Oh, let us make joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with songs. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Psalms 95, may the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. We're going to continue our worship with some fun, worshipful choruses. Lord, I lift your name on high, and his name is wonderful. I'm thinking I'm going to have you all stand. You're going to want to be standing for this. You might even have to move your feet a little bit. Lift your name on high, Lord, I love to sing your praises, I'm so glad you're in my life, I'm so glad you came.
Prepare us for prayer. We have you joining us with an acapella of um, what a friend we have in Jesus. Thank you. Everyone singing. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. tears during grace alone that was one of my dad's favorite songs from promise keepers and so that was just a special song um, for us <laughs> um, and it's funny how god works just everything kind of pulls together and as i was listening to the songs this morning what i had thought about reading and depended on debated about reading this morning i'm going to share it's from the book um anxious for nothing um the max lucado book it says the widest river in the world is not the Mississippi, Amazon, or Nile. The widest river on earth is a body of water called if only. Throngs of people stand on its banks and cast longing eyes over the waters. They desire to cross but can't seem to find the ferry. They are convinced that if only river separates them from the good life. If only I were thinner, I'd have the good life. If only I were richer, I'd have the good life. If only the kids would come, if only the kids were gone, if only I could leave home, move home, get married, get divorced. If only my skin were clear of pimples, my calendar free of people, my profession immune to layoffs, then I would have the good life. The if only river. Are you standing on its shores? Does it seem the good life is only, is always one if only away? One purchase away, one promotion away, one election, transition, or romance away? You're in a hurry to cross the river and worried that you never will. Consequently, you work long hours, borrow more money, take on new projects, and pile on more responsibilities, stress, debt, short nights, long days, all part of the cost of the ticket to the land, to the good life, right? Not exactly, opined the Apostle Paul. The good life begins not when circumstances change, but when our attitude towards them does. Look at his antidote for anxiety. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Paul embedded the verses, two essential, in, in the verses, two essential words that deserve special attention with thanksgiving. Sprinkled among your phrases, help me, please give me, won't you show me, should be two wonderful words. Thank you. Gratitude leads us off the riverbank of if only and escorts us into the fertile valley of already. The anxious heart says, Lord, if only I had this, that, or the other, I'd be okay. The grateful heart says, oh look, you've already given me this, that, and the other. 
Thank you, God. Are you standing on the banks of If Only Like Me this week? <laughs> it's been a stressful week, and we live in a, a stressful, chaotic world, but here we are. But let's go into that fertile valley of already and together this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with our if onlys. We're all facing our own circumstances, things that we don't know how we're going to get through, but we know that you've been there with us in the past, Lord, and we thank you for getting us to this point. Thank you for all the things that you've done behind the scenes that we are not even aware of. And thank you, Lord, that you will continue working for us. And that even though we're in the darkest circumstance or don't know where to go, that you already know the answer. And Lord, we just come to you with thankful hearts this morning that we can be thankful that you're going to get us through and that someday we'll be able to look back and recognize your hand in the, in the midst of it. Father, I just ask that you continue to go with us through this week and bring us back together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you this morning, Lord. Because if we come to you boldly, Lord, in the name of Christ, you listen to us. And we ask you, Lord, to please speak to us this morning. Speak to me. Humble me, Lord. And I ask you to, I pray for every single family that's here, every youth, every child. May you guard them from the evil one. We know we live in a great controversy. And we ask you, Father, to please protect us and to give us wisdom, Lord, in these days. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I made a joke on first service, they say that when you get married, you look different. I don't know how true that is. I'll let you decide that. Matthew chapter 24, we're going to open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, this will be a continuation of the last chap the last sermon I did on Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29. I want to read a hope that we have. Say amen if you're there. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a, gra with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. The greatest promise of the Bible, and I will challenge anyone, is the second coming of Jesus. Amen. At the second coming of Jesus, there is a resurrection. Amen. 
where we are reunited with loved ones that have fallen asleep as the Bible will as the Bible tells us happens and there is a first revelation that has to happen which is the true revelation and that is when Jesus Christ comes back again this is the hope of the Christian church this has been the hope of the historical Christian church and it continues to be the, the hope for any of the, the denominations of the Christian church. The second coming of Christ. The day of what? Of the Lord. But there are two more revelations that have to happen before the true revelation. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, it begins by stating the revelation of Jesus Christ that word revelation or that word revealed is the word apocalypsis. What's the word? Apocalypsis. I'm not going to give you a Greek lecture. Don't worry. But that's significant. I, it's the word apocalypsis. And I want to read a verse that Jesus says. This is, not, this is not me saying this. This is who? This is Jesus. Jesus says, and now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may what? You may believe. So, so what Jesus is saying is, I have told you things that will happen in the future. Let me put it this way. I have told you prophecy. I have given you prophecy so that when you study these prophecies, so, so that when you present these prophecies to the person who has never heard these prophecies before, and maybe there's someone here today that has never heard the prophecies before, Jesus says that when you present these prophecies, it will cause someone to believe. So that when you see them happen, you believe. I want to give you a very simple and basic fundamental uh, that we know about uh, how would Jesus return. Just laying the foundation, bear with me. Uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, I'll just read it very quickly. The Bible says, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, verse 11, uh, he was taken up, Jesus was taken up. Uh, and they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up? into the heavens this same jesus who was taken up from you into heaven was so will come in like manner as you saw him going into heaven now this is significant because there are many and was and are many teachings that believe that when jesus does come back a second time he is not coming back in a physical form in fact his resurrection was not physical. That is what some teachers believe. But the way that Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father in the book of Acts tells us that Jesus was in physical form, and if he ascended in physical form, the, the text tells us that he will also come back in a literal way. One more verse. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Behold, he is coming with clouds. The word clouds there can be interpreted as angels. He is coming with the angels. Amen. He is coming with the angels and every eye will see him. Even they that pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so. Amen. So second point. The, the first point is that the second coming of Jesus will be a literal event. And secondly, the second coming of Jesus will be universal everyone sh will see and experience the second coming of christ and this leads to the third point which is probably the best point for all of us the second coming of jesus will be personal amen amen we we want to be reunited with those that he, we have lost on earth i i i would love to meet certain members that i've never got to meet um in my family. And so we're all looking forward to that very day. So let us go back to Matthew. 
And I told you that this will be a continuation of the last one. So we're in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And we will be in verse 32. What verse? And Matthew chapter 24, a quick recap of what we went through in the last sermon that I preached titled Stein Watchers. Right? That we saw the structure of Matthew 24. And, and the disciples came to Jesus. The Bible says that the disciples came to Jesus in private. Right? Because they were going to ask about the destruction of the temple. And you could not speak about these things publicly. So they came to Jesus in private and they asked. I, I'm convinced that these disciples were Seventh-day Adventists. They were looking for signs. We love signs, do we? They were looking for signs, and, and their motivation was not in the right place. And sometimes our motivation with prophecy is not in the right place. Amen? And so they asked for a sign, and Jesus goes through the entire Matthew 24 discourse, but he only really gives one sign. He only really gives one sign. Even though there's many signs, there's pestilence, there's famines, there's, there's, there's earthquakes, there's wars, and rumors, of, and, and, and all these things are going to happen, but Christ only really gives one sign. What is that sign? The abomination of desolation. And this abomination of desolation, Christ says, that when you see it, can you see a sign? Are signs meant to be seen? Are meant to be seen. So he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, pretend this is the abomination of desolation, whatever it is, whatever that, it, that thing is, when you see it, then flee. That's flee to the mountains, and, and those who are, who are in Judea flee and not go back to get your clothes. So the abomination of desolation is what gives way to the tribulation. Um, stay with me, please. There's a point to this. The abomination is what causes everything else to unroll. And what is it that causes the abomination of desolation? The gospel, what? Come on, y'all. The gospel being preached to the whole world. So what do we do? We preach the gospel. We preach the gospel because in preaching the gospel, it's what's going to give way to the abomination of desolation being set up. And when the abomination of desolation is set up, then the end will come. That's kind of an overview of Matthew 24. Now we're going to pick up in the other half, which we didn't go through, and this will be in verse 32. I don't preach long. You guys know. <laughs> I don't know who said that, but it's better I don't know. Verse 32. Stay with me. Now, Jesus said, now learn this parable. Huh. To learn what? The parable of what? Of the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Now let me ask you a question. Where was the parable of the fig tree given? Matthew 21. Now let's go, let us go to Matthew 21 very quickly. I'm usually not a preacher that will quote a hundred texts to make one point. I don't like doing that. But just stay with me, please. Matthew, tw uh, Matthew 21. Are you in Matthew 21? Now, let me tell you. Matthew 21 begins by Jesus entering Jerusalem. Jesus enters Jerusalem. And then what happens right after he enters Jerusalem? Jesus goes into the what? The temple. Huh. Why does he go into the temple? This is a very famous story, guys. W w what does he do in the temple? He cleanses the temple. Let me put it this way. He shakes the church. He shakes the church. God, Jesus goes into Jerusalem, and the first thing he does is that he shakes the church 
because there are things in the church that should not be in the church. There are things in God's house that should not be in God's house. And so he flips tables. And after he flips the table, what does he do next? (laughs) He's walking by and he sees a fig tree. And he curses it. Let me translate it. Probation closes for the fig tree. You with me? Probation closes for the fig tree right after he shakes his church. We're back in Matthew 24. Jesus told us to go back and study this parable, to study this. It's it's for a reason. God is trying to wake us up. Christ is trying to get us ready because he is already ready. Verse 33. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Verse 36. But of that day, an hour no one knows of what day and hour on the day of the Lord on the second coming how many people know no one does a special remnant know no no one knows and it makes me sad but I'll say it that we sometimes hear sermons on preachers putting dates to the second coming of Jesus. Pastors who read the scriptures try to guess when Christ will come back. Very, very naive. Jesus says no one knows. No one, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only we sometimes are trying to access knowledge that is in the Father. Verse 37, but as the days of Noah were also, sorry, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage into the day that Noah entered the ark. Notice, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. When Jesus here is bringing us back to the story of Noah. Now, what's interesting about the story of Noah is that when God commands Noah to build the ark and to take animals, he says to enter into the ark for how many days before the flood? Seven, huh? So Noah was in the ark before the destruction came. Are you with me? Noah entered the ark, but the destruction did not come right away. But let me ask you a question. Did those on the outside know? Noah was in the ark, and what the, what, what the rest of the world at the time did not know was that the door of the ark was shut. But there was peace and safety still. The destruction had not yet come. But probation had closed. The Bible says, Jesus says, that the that as the days of Noah were, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes again. The term thief in the night. How many of you have ever heard thief in the night? Uh, when I was younger... Uh, I used to hear that phrase a lot. And how do you think that phrase kind of made me feel as a, chi- as, a ca- as a child? Scared. You know, it's, it's like, when is he coming now? 
And the way it's kind of presented from time to time is that God is just going to kind of sneak up. But I started to think, you know, when you, when you look at the gospel story, when you think of, of, of the gospel that Jesus went through, that Jesus became a man, that he suffered, that he was beaten, that he was put on a cross for you and me. And he did all that just for, in the end, he would sneak up on us. It made no sense to me. So what is it that will come as a thief in the night? It is the probation period that comes as a thief in the night. And as the disciples asked in Matthew 24, give us the signs, give us the, 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 give us the signs of what these things will be. There is no sign for the close of probation. Which is why Christ tells us to be ready always. Verse 40, two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two men will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. When I was younger, I read a series, a book. I don't know if any of you have ever read it. It's titled Left Behind. Anyone ever read it? One. Amen. Two. Left Behind series by Jerry B. Jenkins and Timothy LaHaye. It's a very popular and the very central theme of the Left Behind series is this doctrine that may, many of you may have heard called the rapture. I read a joke that said the secret rapture is so secret that Jesus didn't even know. But the, ce- and, but the central teaching of this, of this doctrine is that Jesus will come in secret. Jesus will come in secret, and they take these two verses, as we read, and, and they imply it that Jesus will come, and, and God's people will be raptured and snatched away, and the rest of us who are not raptured will remain on earth for seven years, and then the tribulation happens. The problem with this teaching is that we know that when Noah was in the ark, did Jesus save Noah, or did God save Noah from the flood? Or through the flood. Noah had to go through the flood. Daniel. Did he did, did, did God save Daniel from the lions or with the lions? Daniel God did not remove Daniel from that situation. God was with Daniel during that situation. And and this this uh teaching can be very uh, dangerous and very sticky because it teaches that when the millennial is set up, the millennial is set up on earth. And we know that in the millennial, Christ is with us. So if the millennial is set on the earth, then Christ will be on the earth during the tribulation. I know it's a lot. Just stay with me. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm going somewhere. We're going to end in 1 Thessalonians. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. We, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I began this sermon by stating that there are how many revelations that have to happen? There are three revelations. We began by reading the first revelation, which is the true revelation of Jesus. When Jesus comes to save uh, his church, he's coming back. The, The New Testament teaches that Christ is coming back for his church. But there's another revelation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. Paul is going to give us some encouraging words. I want you to follow along. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Least your sorrow as others who have no hope, even in a funeral that you may have been to of a loved one. It must be very difficult, of course, but there is hope. And the Apostle Paul wants to make that very clear. 
that if you have lost a loved one, that you can see them again. Amen. Verse 14. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So those who die in Christ and those who are alive to see Jesus come will be caught up together. There's a reason for that. Verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Amen? The dead in Christ will rise first. Now, why? Why do the dead in Christ rise first? I believe that Jesus is so loving <laughs> that he knows that, many, that all of us have witnessed a loved one go down and buried. And when th those who die in Christ are resurrected, we will be able to witness them come up. Amen. We will see them rise. Which is why we don't precede them. God wants to show you that he has delivered in what he has promised. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Where are we meeting the Lord? In the air, not the ground. Not the ground. We meet the Lord in the air. Chapter 5, verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. The Apostle Paul is, is making it clear that these Thessalonians at the time, they had a knowledge of this. Right? They had a knowledge. And within the first century, Paul and John have to deal with something called Gnosticism. The apocryphal books. The other books. There are many books that, uh, and this is not the topic of today, but there are many books that never made it into the canon of Scripture. And, and, and what happened was when the apostles died, many people were making their own letters saying that, oh, I'm Peter, but Peter has been dead for 200 years. And so many people were, 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 were making their own, uh, they were making their own letters and their own uh, doctrine, their own teaching. And so John and Paul had to contend with this. And and what he does is, is something very brilliant, because the f the very root of Gnosticism is that it is knowledge that is secret. Oh, the vaccine. I won't go there. Don't worry. The, the vaccine, you, you think that there's something more to that. Let me show you. Secret knowledge. God's knowledge, beloved, is for all. God doesn't give secret knowledge to, a, to one group of people to not share with anyone. That, that does not benefit the body of Christ. Amen? And so he had to contend with this. And so what Paul does is says, for you yourselves, no. Instead of getting into an argument with them about who's right, this, that, or there, he said, no, 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 you already know. Very wise. You already know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the what? In the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction falls upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Now, the, the pregnant woman is fascinating because I have no idea how it is to give birth. 
But there's something I do know, because I've read it. That the closer you get to your due date, the bigger you get, correct? But not only that, when you're in the stage of about to give birth, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what that's called, forgive me. L- yeah. There's something that happens. The pain increases in intensity and in frequency. And it gets to, I mean, I've seen the movies, <laughs> you know. And the pain increases in intensity and in frequency, but then something happens. Someone comes. Amen? Someone comes, and the pain goes away. Eventually. But there's someone who came, and life is given. New life. And Jesus says, the, sorry, the apostle says, that as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, These people will never, will not escape. Wrapping up, but you, brethren, are not in darkness so that the day should not overtake you as a thief. Every single person in this room right now does not have to be surprised on what we are seeing in society. The Apostle Paul adds a qualifier and he states that you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not night night nor of darkness and we're going to end in second thessalonians just a chapter a book after in chapter two and this will be the last chapter of this morning don't say amen to that second thessalonians reminder we were talking about how many revelations three the first revelation is the true revelation of Jesus Christ. Now look what the Apostle Paul says to the same church. To the same church. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now brethren. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our gathering together to him. We ask you. Not to be shaken in mind. Or troubled. Either by a spirit. Or by word or by letter, as if from us. It is very clear that people at the time were misconstruing Paul's words. As though the day of Christ had come. Many people believed that the day of the Lord had already come, but they were confused because we're still here. And as we learned, when Christ comes, every eye shall see him. Verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means. Forgive me. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the fallen away comes first and the man of sin is revealed The son of perdition. Now, I started the sermon by saying that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, it says that the revelation of Jesus Christ. Does anyone remember the word that I said? I made you all say it. The Greek word, apocalypsis. The word revealed in verse 3 is the same word. It's the same word, apocalypsis. In other words, what Paul is saying is that the coming of this man will be like the coming of Christ. And the coming of Christ cannot, will not happen unless this coming happens first. This is very significant. There is so much confusion in eschatology today, which is simply the study of of last day events total confusion because we have gone so far as to make up our own theories and our own teachings and not come back to the scriptures and so the apostle paul says a revealing has to happen and we know that in context i want to make this very very 
clear that in contact with the camera, you know it is nowadays, right? You're, you're filmed for everything. I want to make this very, very clear that the context of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we know it's speaking about Rome. But my emphasis is not Rome today. There's another revealing. We see that the revealing is the son of perdition. There is one other place that that word is used in the entire Bible. Does anyone know? With Judas. Judas is called the son of perdition. Now let me ask you a question. Was Judas a follower of Jesus? Was Judas within the... Was Judas religious? Was Judas within the body of Christ? The apostasy and the revelation comes within God's church, not without. It's no wonder why the spirit of prophecy tells us that we have more to fear within than without. Sometimes we're looking at the beast without, but we don't look at the beast within. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as a God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. It's very clear. Whoever this person is wants to be what? God. Worship. Do you not remember that when I told you that I was with you, sorry, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you all these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, for he now restrains will do so until he is taken out. I want to read two quotes. Two quotes. Fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens. In the token of the power of miracle working demons, the spirits of devils go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to fasten them in deception and to urge them to unite with Satan in his last struggle against the government of heaven. By these agencies, rulers and subjects will be alike deceived. Persons will arise pretending to be Christ himself and claiming the title of worship which belongs to the world's redeemer. They will perform wonderful miracles. They will perform what? Of healing. And will profess to have revelations from heaven contradicting the testimony of the scriptures. Let's read verse, verse 9. I'm wrapping up. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. With all powers, signs, Lying and wonders. Didn't we just read that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When Satan is revealed, he is going to do what? Miracles. The first revelation is the true revelation of Christ. The second revelation is the counterfeit revelation. But beloved, the third revelation, which I'm going to end here, is the most important revelation. Satan is not permitted to counterfeit the manner of Christ's advent. The Savior has warned his people against deception upon this point and has clearly foretold the manner of his second coming. There shall arise false Christs and false prophets and show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, she goes on to quote Matthew 24, to deceive the very elect. This coming, there is no possibility of counterfeiting. Let me ask you a question. Why can Satan counterfeit the true, co the true coming? Talk to me. Why can't he? Sorry? There you go. He cannot be everywhere. Only God can do that. Amen? This coming, there is no possibility of counterfeiting. It will be universally known, witnessed by the whole world. Jesus said, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Last revelation. 
the last revelation is the revelation of God's church. And you know, we study prophecy, we study all these things, but we sometimes we realize that we're so focused on the beast without that we have a beast in our hearts on the way we treat people. On the way we treat others. And there has to be a revelation with every single human being that's on earth. Last one. Only those who have, dili- who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusions that takes the whole world captive. By the Bible testimony, these will detect the deceiver in his disguise. Now listen to this. To all the testing time will come. To how many? To all. By the sifting of temptation, the genuine Christian will be revealed. Are the people of God now so firmly established upon his words that they would not that they would not yield yield to the evidence of their senses? Would they in such crisis cling to the Bible and the Bible only? Satan will, if possible, prevent them from obtaining a preparation to stand in that day. He will so arrange affairs as to hedge up their way, entangle them, entangle them with earthly treasures, causing them to carry a heavy, worrisome burden that their hearts may be, may be overcharged with the cares of this life and the day of the trial may come upon them as a thief. My appeal to everyone is, and to myself, is to find Jesus today. Amen? You don't need the book of Revelation to motivate you. And sometimes we do that. It's like a drug. Last day event gets us all fizzy and, 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 and we react to that as if Jesus is not enough. The day of the Lord will come, but the counterfeit has to happen before. And if we're not ready today, those two events don't matter. I invite you to stand as I pray. Let us bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you have given us words. You have told us things that will come to pass that when we see them, we will believe. And I ask you, Father, to give us a revival. To give us a revival in our lives and to prioritize our times right, whether we are young or old. It is still possible to see young people follow Jesus. The world may tell us one thing, but we stand on the word. And we ask you, Father, to please send the Holy Spirit upon us to convict us, Lord, and to give us a spirit of mourning, of spiritual mourning, I ask you, Father, to please comfort everyone here. If there's anyone here doubting, if there's anyone here doubting that you're even real, God, you've told us things that will come to pass, and they are coming to pass. You don't will that any shall perish, Lord, but that all shall come to repentance. Every single person in this room, I want to see in the kingdom. And we'll laugh and brag about who was right and who was wrong. But Lord, come quickly. But prepare us, Lord, to meet you today. I ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen.
God bless you all. Happy Sabbath.